Um, yeah, so I grew up with a real strong ethic of conformity, um, comfort, make, making sure for the comfort of all the people around you and um, people pleasing. Um, and I got really good at that. And I, um, I also grew up with um, one of my parents really singularly focused on, on making money and being in business. And there was no, really literally no access to that person as a small child. Um, except I began to notice at a young age if I was talking about like a little business ideas or money. And so I gained access to that parent um, by getting masterful around ideas of money and um, started starting small businesses at the age of seven and doing spreadsheet analysis by the age of nine on the computer. <laughs> um, and I didn't understand that that's what was happening until about 20 years later um, after living the first half of my life as a businesswoman and um, that combines really well with people pleasing and making others comfortable and getting approval because a business owner is the thing everybody wants to be. Oh, you're a business owner. I remember early on in my shop, people came in and they'd say, oh my gosh, your dream came true. Look, you're a business owner. You have a chocolate factory, you have a chocolate shop. Your dream came true and I would feel terrible inside. I didn't really know why, but it made me mad. Like, you don't know my dreams. That's what came up for me when people would say that. But everybody thinks that it's your dream to be a business owner. That's what, that has power. You dominate others. You are dominant. And in the patriarchy, that's what's good. Um, so that was, that's a really big aspect of my relationship to money. I'm a creative person. I'm a writer. Writing is my gift and thinking critically about the edge, the future edge of where humanity's going and thinking through the words and surfacing through spirit what we have to say to each other about that. So I'm um, moving into the second half of my life as a writer and healing and also at the same time really grateful for my relationship to money and business, however it was formed. Um, and then the second half of my um, my journey with money and the, the pivotal story around that is um, in the last three years, my family came into very sudden, very tremendous wealth. Um, I must feel compelled to give you a content warning because I don't like to avoid using numbers. I think we don't use numbers when we talk about money and we should. And so I will, but when you say a number like this, and then you look at me different, you think, oh, she's impervious to pain and troubles, <laughs> which isn't true. But my parents sold a business for $100 million right in the middle of the pandemic. They had started three years before. It was a, it was a fluke. It wasn't like this was something that we lived in a high net wealth business as a family all our life. It was very sudden. And as that was approaching for about, about eight months before that happened, I knew that I would be privy to some of that money. And I got very um, out, ungrounded in my body and I sought guidance from elders or friends really. Um, there aren't many elders um, for me that model um, how to relate to the patriarchy or move away from relating to it. And um, so I got the advice to see a very powerful body worker, an ancestral healer in Montpelier that I did. And um, I recognized that, like this lung analogy, that money is like oxygen. You need enough to come in, you need it to go out, and you need a healthy flow of it. So if I was going to start to become privy to mass massively more amounts of money, then I would um, need to figure out where it was going to go, what that energy flow was going to look like in my body, because it's not like I can just have something come and sit in it, all this power, all this energy, that's not healthy for me. And I don't want to also be that stupid, naive girl, environmentalist, hippie that is stigmatized for a bleeding heart giving the money away or doing things with it that are nice um, and that end up harming me. Um, so... 
there's there's just so little modeling and I and I went into a deep journey about what does this mean and how how do I relate to the flow of money I love moving money I love resources and the abundance of resources on the earth and which money is one of and that we can move these things I don't really love money so I can accumulate it but I love that I can move it and with movement there's change and with change we can rearrange the status quo so how do we move resources is much more interesting to me than how do we accrue them. Um, and so um, by the time I the transaction happened, the big transaction, when everything just moves and suddenly a bunch of people have a different amount of energy and power inside of them, um, I had come to a, a, a fair relationship with my understanding about wanting to make local investments and think about um, ways that I can safely, without putting myself at harm, support things that are growing in my immediate community that I can understand. And as I was doing that, I was really excited because my parents are very innovative and I assumed that they were doing the same thing and that they were thinking about how they were gonna move their resources and what they were gonna create and how they were gonna address wealth inequality with all of this power, because they're incredibly creative. And um, it came to just a few days before the transaction and I, I said to my, um, my mother, or we were just having a conversation and she said, oh yeah, we had our stockbroker over last night and he's just such a nice guy. He's such a nice guy. He and his colleague came and we had drinks and God, he's just such a nice guy. And I felt my whole body just, just numb. Just like, I didn't know, I was overcome with a sense of terror and I didn't understand it that well in the moment. Um, but I said, well, what are you telling him about your, what you're gonna, willing to invest in? And she said, well, he's just really great. He knows what, what, we've, what we're supposed to invest in. I said, well, he works for you. What are you, what are you, what are you gonna tell him about, you know, what are your limits, you know? And I didn't have the words, because I didn't, I didn't even know what was coming up for me, but I, I, was, I had made a bunch of assumptions about how they would be going into this, and I was so wrong. And it was came down in this one phone call, and um, and I started to get escalated, and she started to get defensive because she could feel that I had all this fear in my body, and you could feel it over the phone, and it was palpable. And um, we commenced the worst fight we'd ever had that only lasted about three minutes, and it happened so fast, and I can't even believe the the, the power and the harm and the destruction that happened in that one phone call, and. Um, there's such things as, like I said, um, I just started to say, well, what about what about weapons, you know, manufacturing and, and prisons and and what about the chemical industry and big ag and wh what do you mean? I mean, he doesn't. You, you can go outside of your investor. I mean, he, you can you can invest in other things besides what Jake tells you because Jake says invest. He's interested in you, you know, keeping your money with him. And she's going, you know. I don't have any opinions about this. You know, she's getting really shut down. And I said, Mom, you're the person that went with me, right? In high school, didn't we go to the Lakota Reservation and we learned about the sun and the moon and about the cycles of Earth? And aren't you that person that, that cares about people and loves people? You know, and I kind of start to attack her humanity. And she shuts down completely. And that conversation becomes um, something that's impossible to have. And um, so that's the beginning then of two years of trying to figure out where do I not speak and not be authentic and not use my voice because I love my family and want to value relationships, but it's all also resonating from a book I had just read, Raising Our Hands, how white women need to stand to the front lines and take their rightful place in social change. And I start to notice that my silence about thinking about how this money is invested is critical to the entire survival of our family and the identity of our family moving forward. And the idea of generational wealth continuing and that none of your children or their children or their children will ever have to work again is the new mantra. And that's the, the, the central value of the family now um, for which my questions about what our investment values are is a direct challenge. And so making sure that any ideas I have about that are silly, are mean, are hateful, are causing my, you know, that I'm causing problems for my family because I want to, and I want to be challenging for the sake of it, um, becomes my identity within my family, which is starting to heal um, slowly, slowly. It takes time, it takes dialogue, it takes patience and a lot of self-esteem. 
And, um, but through it all, I really, um, you know, I really began to lament how alone I felt in these concerns. My astounding, astoundedness with how money funnels directly to the stock market, which funnels directly to war and to prisons and chemicals and the destruction of the land in a very direct way, returning 12% profits during COVID for two years in a row. Can't beat 12%. And I began to really lament that I didn't have any elders that could teach me about how to heal the earth and myself. And it was around that time that I um, got the book, Screwnomics, and I, and I had the incredible, incredible blessing of me meeting Ricky Gard Diamond, who's become a very important elder for me, and somebody that has the wisdom that I need, that I've always needed. Um, so the amount of knowledge and facts that she can bring to this conversation about why, why are we filled with fear and anxiety and disconnect when we think about money and when we experience things with money and the answers that she can bring through the way she has excavated human history, recent human history around money is such a gift to us today and it is my incredible pleasure an honor to introduce Ricky Gard Diamond. Yeah, I'm gonna go over here, but holy smokes, what an introduction. How will I ever live up to that, huh? I'm terrified. No, really, I, I am actually thrilled to be here in your company and be talking and hearing you all talk about things that I, you know, hear the echoes of conversations I've had while looking up at the ceiling in my bedroom late at night, you know. I am uh, here to convince you of the va value of becoming an amateur economist. That's what I am. I'm an amateur economist. Now, my husband doesn't like me to use that term because, you know, it kind of makes you less serious. No one's going to take you um, seriously if you call yourself an amateur. But the root word, the root of that word, Ama, any of you study Latin in school? Love, it's love. And we have a love-starved economy right now that is very much waged as war. And you here are all talking about an economy waged as life, as living life, right? And so I, will, I just am thrilled to be here in your company. There is so much energy and... Um, Ray, I loved your, what, loved your story, even though, you know, oh my God, what a story. Um, but I'm an amateur economist because every mistake in the book, I probably made it. And the book that I wrote is um, a kind of combination memoir, um, feminist e economic Tome. It has little um, definitions. I, I heard someone say they didn't know what a commodity was. Don't be ashamed of that. Nobody talks about what a commodity is. You're expected to know that, right? It's all in uh, Scrunomics. And I want you to know that the Scrunomics books back there were heavy for me to carry here. I hope not to carry any of them out of here again. This is uh, at half price. It's 10 bucks. If you don't have 10 bucks, take a book anyway. I, I put some extra dollars in the Kleenex box there. So um, I really would like not to take any of those books home. Maybe you have friends who might be interested in, in, it, in it. But we want to um, use this money, not for me to take home, but for um, us to come back again, maybe next year, and begin to talk about and catch up on um, what, we've, what we've learned from our experience, what we've learned from our own bodies, what we've learned um, that we can apply to um, a therapeutic, therapeutic journey to financial freedom. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to sit down, which will prevent me from falling off the stage here when I turn around and look at, see what I'm going to say. All right. So um, you can all hear me, right? Yeah. Okay. Speak more into the mic, she says. Okay. 
So let me uh, let me start this so that we can uh, see where we're going to go. Okay. SWP got it wrong. This is She Writes Press. They were the publishers of my book, and um, I love them. They're a great press. But this is the first um, prototype of the cover of the book, and they really got it wrong. You can see the title is Screwnomics. You can see the um, uh, little asterisk there that defines what Screwnomics is. It's a word I had to coin to name what I saw all around me. The idea, the economic theory, that women should always work for less money and even better for free, right? So um, the book I um, wrote has my own story in it, but also the stories of a lot of different women who had different ideas about this, the uh, economy. And uh, this is a picture not of what I wrote about, but of the economy as it is today. Do you recognize that hand gripping that those bucks? Uh, this is the libertarian free market, right? This is it, the way, this is success you're looking at. And it's every man for himself, and you gotta try to be the smartest guy in the room, right? That's not what I found when I talked with women about the economy. It looked like this. I used to um, cut out paper dolls, I'm that old. But um, I never did it with a dollar before, but I, I think it's a beautiful picture. And I said, when you put this on the cover, you've gotta make sure it curves up because they've gotta be dancing, right? So that was uh, when I've learned that when women have a say in the economy, they, they, they say different things. And a couple of the women in the book are, uh, a, a woman you probably recognize, Emma Goldman, who said, if I can't dance, I won't join your revolution. Uh huh. And um, the wonderful Ela Bott, uh, who is the founder of Siwa. Anybody here know what Siwa is? No, of course not. It's not in the newspaper, but you should all know about it. It's the Self-Employed Women's Association of India. And Ela Bott was a union organizer She's the one who said, we are poor, but we are so many. She thought, you know, these women need to organize. They were out in the streets, the poorest of the poor, dealing in rags and, uh, you know, uh, foodstuffs from their garden, uh, just the poorest of the poor. And she said, you've got to organize. We're going to form a union. And the unions all said, well, you can't, you can't have a union. You're, you're self-employed. You're entrepreneurs. You're one of the business owners. And she said, well, let's change the rules. And they did become a union. And they envisioned themselves, I don't have a picture of it here, but they envisioned themselves not as a, you know, the typical uh, corporate triangle with the titular head way up here and the lowly workers down at the bottom, the greatest numbers of those. No, they pictured their organization as a growing, living banyan tree with all kinds of leaves and branches and all kinds of roots. Um, it's a wonderful idea to envision your company as a living thing. So um, two women that were important to me. Now we're going to talk about what is seldom talked about in economic circles, because it's kind of rude to say it out loud. But our economy is the product of a man-to-man -man discourse that is about 2,400 years old. They've been talking together about the economy for 2,400 years when that word oikonomia was coined by the Greeks. Translated, it literally means household management, which we know a little bit about. But we have not been part of that conversation at all. The uh, little diagram is a picture of how the story is told in that uh, discourse. You don't see any women there anywhere. You can see the glorious outcome, right? We've evolved. So let's take a look at um, another more gendered picture. Women's economic big picture. This is going to take a little while. These are fancy slides, aren't they? I'm so excited about this. <laughs> uh, 
this is uh, this this is the Paleolithic uh, figurine called Venus of Willendorf. She is thirty thousand years old. She was carved with stone tools from a woolly mammoth tusk. Can you believe it? So we were we were around. All right. <laughs> This is the Neolithic period, like 12,000 years ago. Um, and this is a, literally a model of the, the goddess Ceres, who's atop our state house next door. Um, and uh, we'll talk about more about why she's holding a sheaf of wheat and why that matters to the economy. And this is a figure you recognize right away, right? Who is she? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so now let's talk economics. So what did women do? Well, 30,000 years ago, women are credited by archaeologists with having had the ingenious idea of twisting fibers together to form threads and then weaving them together with these looms they built with sticks and stones and weighted uh, yarns, and they invented cloth, which, you know, in the Ice Age, probably was kind of important. <laughs> Think about it. All right. So going back 12,000 years, this is a, an outdoor uh, oven because when women were out gathering food, which they were mostly providing most of the food for most households, meat was a specialty, um, they would sometimes drop seeds through the uh, cloth that bags that you see there that they had made, they were carrying their babies, they were carrying bunches of uh, herbs and, and plants and bringing it back home. Some of the seeds would drop out and they began to notice, hey, when you drop these seeds, they sprout. And then women about 12,000 years ago began to invent what's called agriculture, right? Oh, I need to keep it, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, um, is that better? Oh, now it's echo echoing. How's that? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. So the seeds dropped in the on, on the ground. Um, the archaeologists credit women with having invented agriculture, and um, then they had to have uh, because they had surplus food for the first time. They had to have containers to store it and they began to bake clay and make pottery, which is also women's realm, right? Pretty good invention. And then uh, because they had stored grain, they began to do things like bake bread. Can you imagine if you were out, you know, digging up roots and that sort of thing, how good bread would smell when it was baking? That was our doing. And then, Ah, this is a, um, is a, uh, what do you call this? Uh, yes, a circular saw. Thank you very much. This was actually invented um, 250 years ago. No, I take that back. I don't know when she invented this. But what I wanted to say about the Statue of Liberty was that she marks the period when uh, the... Our forefathers in 1776 declared our liberty from the um, King George, remember? And um, at the time, they happened to be the richest uh, men in the colonies, and they happened to be killing natives and uh, bringing over slaves and also marrying women who under the common law of that day, any property that she had, any rights that she had were subsumed into his identity. Um, so <clears throat> Tabitha Babbitt was a shaker woman who invented this circular saw by attaching it to her spinning wheel. Yeah. Now, by that time, the spinning wheel was old hat, you see, because the Industrial Revolution, which was fueled by coal and oil, had made it possible for men to uh, take over the textile industry, which had been women's realm, and make a lot of money at that, making it a commodity. 
Um, and also, uh, by then they were cooking food in tin cans and making a lot of money too. And they began to transform women producers of really ingenious items um, and, and renamed us as something they still call us, which is consumers. It's not a very flattering term. We are producers. We're not consumers. Consumers is like, um, we have fires in California that are consuming. Those are what we need to think about, right? What the takeaway from this is, is that women were the very first property. Back in the day, if you uh, needed a bigger population, or you needed, uh, uh, you know, you, the Romans did it. They they invaded the Sabines. They uh, raped the Sabines. It's a famous story. There is all kinds of uh, literature and and um, statuary that depict that. You stole the women, and then she belonged to you. And so, the um, the first property was our reproductive powers and our labor, controlled by force law, religion, and customs as wives, concubines, don't forget them, and slaves the past 5,000 years, the foundation of every so-called civilization and its wealth. Rape and control of women's bodies is still being weaponized today. We know that from the Dobbs decision, the latest proof of that, and misogyny is still used to control and devalue all things and all genders supposedly female and therefore soft. So let's talk about more recent history because the shadow of um, survival being controlled by men um, survival of you, whether you were a slave, a concubine, or a wife, is thrown a long shadow. So this is a picture of the famous, world famous, contralto singer Marian Anderson in 1939. She's giving a famous concert at the Lincoln Memorial. And she's outdoors because she's been denied a concert at Constitutional Hall. Her race was the reason the hall's owners were the daughters of the American Revolution. Not the daughters of the Confederacy, mind you, but the Mayflower daughters. And despite the 13th, 14th, 15th, and 19th Amendment to the Constitution by then. So now we're citizens, no longer property, but women's hard-won rights remain very intersectional. And here's why I say that. Our rights were won by sections. First, women, black and white, won education that had been denied them until very recently. You can see how recent that is. And property rights were won in, uh, what was it, 1858? I get far enough away, I can't read it. Am I right? 48, okay. And um, those rights were mostly won by women because, uh, white women rather, because most black women remained property until 1865. Ah, oh, look at that. Okay, that way I can look at you. That's good. Thank you. Okay, so now let's look at even more recent history. This is from my lifetime. I know you've seen this in postcard collections, and it's funny, right? But this was real stuff when I was growing up. This was actually in the magazines I was reading, all right? So um, this is an attitude that um, the Republican Party, or a, a good portion of it, seems to have adopted. Uh, the evangelicals still want it to be arranged this way. Um, but I, I'm here to say that no a black or Latina or lesbian woman I know would ever put herself in this position, right? 
And um, the women who started the second uh, wave of the feminist movement didn't either. Um, so, and yet, I want to say that systemic sexism and systemic racism still are dividing and conquering us. Um, oh, that looks different. Huh. Um, in 1920, the 19th Amendment grants uh, the vote to white women, and I say that because brown and black women didn't really win uh, their right to vote until 1965 with the Voting Rights Act. And then in 1973, uh, when women were beginning to see each other as um, a group, which they'd been discouraged from thinking of themselves in that way, uh, we began to make some progress. So we got Roe v. Wade in 1973, 19... Uh, 90, we got Americans with Disabilities Act. In 2015, we got uh, LGBTQ marriage. And now we're looking at possibly losing those again. So our unity is more important than ever. This is a picture of, and this is the latest information we have on um, average family wealth by race. Now, wealth is different from your paycheck, your income. Wealth is um, the assets that you own, the property that you have. When you look at those uh, three figures there, uh, can you guess which is uh, white families, which is Latina families, and which is black families? The order I just said it in. Anybody else want to argue with her about that? No, it's actually white, Spanish, and black. So white families actually possess 10 times the amount of wealth that um, black families have. So you've all played Monopoly. You know how that works, right? <laughs> Uh, so it's still dividing us. And when we allow that to happen, we're all weakened as a result. Why? Because, you know, that guy in with the tie, he's still with us. He lives on Wall Street. Uh, this is a cartoon character from Screwnomics. Yes, Screwnomics does have cartoons in it. <laughs> and um, my collaborator, Pico Todd, um, and I created this character, Blaze Bernays, who is um, has a business card that says, it's your right to profit no matter who pays. And um, that's because uh, there, there remains a, that money really still is talking in a male voice very much. Economics, banking, and money remains a man's world. And if you doubt that, you just need to look at the Wall Street trading floor um, to see what's going on there. And it's, it's a fact that even though now women work in banks, we have bank accounts, uh, sometimes we even manage banks, and yet, the bigger the pile of money, the fewer women are going to be allowed in the vicinity. And if they are allowed, it's because they're doing that Annie Oakley number. Anything you can do, I can do better, right? It's possible, but is it what we, uh, the majority of us want? Um, and I, I want to just uh, give this... Um, um, Disclaimer, I mean, it may be that you work in this money world, or your husband does, or your son does, or your brother does. That doesn't mean that he is Blaise Bernays and this econo man that I'm talking about. Rather, he is like a mythical um, creation that we aspire to that really needs to be um, challenged and questioned. And if anybody is going to do it, I think it'll be women. Feminist economics are not just for women. It includes all of us, which is why we changed the, horm the pronoun in, um, in our organization, what I'm going to talk about next. Virginia Woolf, back in 1920 or 24, said that um, a woman needed two things. And you probably have heard about this essay she wrote. She said, you need an income 
and you need a room of your own so you can um, you can think your own thoughts, you can find your own voice. But we believe after decades of living with um, pay disparities that we've been talking about for decades now, we believe women also need an economy of our own, a whole new set of rules, a whole new way of no more business as usual. So we put together an organization uh, that you can see in the white at the bottom uh, right-hand corner. It's an economy of our own dot org. Um, and I had met a number of marvelous women who were doing really cool things. And these are some pictures of Crystal Arnold, who's with, uh, has a podcast. WILF, which is Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, a hundred year old organization founded by Jane Adams. Did you know that? Um, there's a committee, Women, Money, and Democracy, uh, at WILF that wor is working closely with an economy of our own. Also, Rianne Eisler, is anybody know that name? She wrote uh, The Chalice and the Blade, and she also wrote a wonderful book called The Real Wealth of Nations, and uh, she's working with us. Uh, Carmen is the one in the pink fuzz there, Carmen Rios. Uh, she's our digital director at An Economy of Our Own. Uh, Mary Beth Gardam down below is... Um, the um, with Women, Money, and Democracy. Jamila Medley is no longer with the Philadelphia Area Cooperative Alliance, but Philadelphia is loaded with cooperative businesses, and she's now working with uh, Black women uh, uh, cooperatives as a consultant. Um, here's Bada, uh, here's um, Jumpa Bhattacharya, who is with in Oakland at Insight uh, Center for Community Economic Development, doing great work uh, with um, centering uh, women in the economy, centering black women in the economy. Uh, there I am. I should have my little pointer here, huh? There I am in my younger days at Bear Pond Books. Um, and Pico Todd is with the leopard there. She's the cartoonist. Um, I have a, a column at Ms. Magazine called Women Unscrewing Screwnomics because I keep on meeting exciting women who are doing new things. So I had to talk about that. Um, Gwen Hallsmith, some of you may know, she's up there with braids. And um, she's not here in Vermont right in, anymore, but she's still very interested in these economic issues. Dee Dee Pershaus is another Vermonter with the Land and Leadership Initiative. And she is um, also the author of a great book about the in connections between health and the environment. Um, and Ellen Brown with the Public Banking Institute. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. And uh, and and the bottom there, Praxis Peace Institute was founded by Georgia Kelly, who does seminars that go to Mondragon, Spain, uh, for learning about the world's largest cooperative um, corporation in the world, operated totally differently. And uh, Basque Spain, just a few decades ago well, maybe more like 50 or 60 years ago, was the poorest region in the nation of Spain and now is um, a tourist destination because um, Georgia says one of the things that you'll notice is that there are no homeless, there are no hovels, and there are no gigantic McMansion neighborhoods either. It's kind of interesting. Another way of doing things. So our overarching question is, uh, how do we transform an economy, wage this war into an economy? Oh, I see this translated into PowerPoint a little differently. Into an economy, waged as life, okay? Um, so we were just going to go to conferences and, and, and talk to people face-to-face, uh, -face, and then, uh, as happened in your life, uh, COVID happened. So we had to re-strategize and think about what we could do. So we created a Zoom of our own, which uh, we put, we, we got women to come into a room together and talk about elements of the economy that women generally don't talk about. Things like uh, currency, you know, who creates it, 
What is it really used for? How does it work? We talked about um, an economic future that could actually afford child care and health care and other things that we're told we can't afford, right? Uh, we talked about cooperative businesses. We talked about public banking. We talked about the way the GDP, the gross domestic product, makes women invisible because caring is nowhere visible in an account that only counts money. Only money counts with the GDP. And it's never subtracted. It's only added, you know. So um, then we also talked about new economic models. We were interested in the environment and, and what's happening that we all are concerned about and new economic models that are circular, oddly enough, mimicking uh, natural cycles. Um, so all of these are posted on our um, uh, on our, let me go back here, on our website uh, under resources. They're all freely available. We have a YouTube channel. And each of these uh, videos, they're, by now there are about 10 of them on other subjects I haven't mentioned. Um, but they all have a, um, you know, a curriculum. I hate to use that word. I wish we could come up with a better word for um, just a, a book list, a movie list, ways you can learn about these things that you might not know about and are only going to um, learn about if you make that effort. And not all of these, you know, the economy is very, very complex. There are lots of different pieces and not all of them are necessary for you to understand. So go with whatever your body is telling. Oh, really? You can do that? Then go there and uh, explore it and become an amateur economist learning about that. So then, because we wanted to take a little deeper dive into per particular subjects, we created what we're calling learning circles. We, so far, we've only had one kind of learning circle. Um, that's the public banking learning circle where I met uh, Jacqueline and Shonda. And uh, we can talk more about um, what they're what they're doing here in in Vermont, but um, we thought that public banking. How many of you here own a bank? Anyone? No. Oh, oh well. You know, it's a great business model because even if you fail, even if you make everybody fail, as happened in two thousand and eight, no worries because the taxpayers are going to bail you out, right? So it's a great business model. If only you could own a bank. Um, well, public banking is a way that we could collectively own a bank and set its direction and tell it what we wanted to have our money go to, like environmental protections, women's entrepreneurial ideas, not business as usual, um, you name it. We could, um, we could do it if we owned our own bank. So that's what that learning circle is about. Now you're probably asking, what is a public bank and how is it different from anything else, right? So while details can be complex, we're, Shonda and, and Jacqueline are, are learning more about the particular details of how do you, how do you make a public bank? It's complicated, but the value of public banking is very easy to understand. So this is just a short video from the Public Banking Institute. ARC is a great idea, but how will they pay for it? The city needs to borrow money, but borrowing money means the city has to pay a lot more money in interest and fees that could double the cost of the park. And that money leaves the city. It goes to Wall Street investors who really don't care about the park or the city at all. This is a bad deal for the city and its residents. There's a much better option. An option that's been proven around the world. A public bank. A public bank is a bank owned by the residents of a city, state, region, or territory. Private Wall Street banks just want to make profits for their shareholders. But public banks have a mission to serve the public good. They have to reflect the values and needs of the community. And that makes all the difference. Politicians don't run a public bank. 
Their job is to just set it up by listening to what the people need and want. Public banks are run by skilled local bankers who know their neighbors. Residents are on the supervising board to keep tabs on what the bank's doing. Public banks can save communities lots of money. First, they cut out expensive Wall Street fees, which can be hundreds of millions of dollars a year in a big city. Second, they can lower interest rates on the city's loans, which means there's more money to spend on other projects. Third, their profits go back to the city, not to Wall Street. So a public bank can make money for the city. All this means the people of the city have a lot more money to fund all the things they need, such as bridges, good roads, good schools, renewable energy, affordable housing, lower taxes, and the park the people wanted. They now control their own money and they can build their own future. Join the movement. To find out more, go to publicbankinginstitute.org. So we now have um, one public bank in the nation, and it's 100 years old. Have any of you heard of it? Do you know anything about where it is? No. It's in a red state, a very red state, very conservative state, North Dakota. And for 100 years, they've been um, using a public bank to um, support local businesses and uh, farms and um, some, some infrastructure for things that we might not want to, but they've made the decisions about what they're going to finance. And they've actually returned money to the, um, the people of North Dakota. They were also the first ones to create um, student uh, loan programs that forgave loans or reduced loans. And I actually heard the... Um, former president of the, or he was the former CEO of this bank, speak about a program that they had just started. One of the things that I first noticed when I began to notice economics that I was shocked by was that when you get a loan from a bank, say you get a mortgage, and um, your credit, you don't have a lot of money, right? Um, and so you you when you don't have as much money when you don't have a good credit history you don't pay less because you can afford less at the bank in interest you pay more interest that's part of what brought on the 2008 crash so um Well, I'd love for you to share that with me. Um, it's it's kind of tricky to, um, a public bank is capitalized by public money. And I, I would be surprised if that New Hampshire bank is using, uh, uh, we just had a new bank started here in Vermont that people were excited about, but it was private capital that capitalized it. What do I mean by that? Private money, private investors, who invested their money to create the bank. With a public bank, it is the, it is we the people, our state revenues, our tax dollars that are capitalizing the bank. And that's a big difference. They're looking for founding partners, right? Yeah. And, and there is a movement, uh, and it's a good thing when uh, local investors because the Wall Street banks are not loaning to Vermont, uh, Shonda, you like to say that the bank that holds our um, our t our public money, M and T Bank. How many of you knew that M and T Bank? Do you know who M and T Bank is? Yeah. Oh, you do know. Good. Well, um, Shonda, you like to say what that they don't. They're not that interested in. He just recently purchased People's United Bank to become the 11th largest bank in the U.S. And so 
Uh, they're having quite a considerable amount of trouble with the merger and takeover. I don't know if you've read the news, but in the state of Connecticut, where people's headquarters were, they fired everybody mm -hmm. in Connecticut. In Vermont, they came and gobbled up a portion um, and threw out most of the uh, employees and, you know, kind of made everybody kind of uh, regroup and re-interview for their positions. Ugh. I luckily got out before that happened. Yay, me. Yay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was kind of like a, a, a nasty merger. But, um, yeah, it's Wall Street money, big banks gobbling up. Because as you may or may not know, People's United Bank in your local community started out as Chittenden yes. Bank, right? Yep. And then I think Chittenden Bank became, was it People's? Mm -hmm. And then People's is now M&T. So the gobbling just keeps continuing. The gobbling is kind of built into the system, the expectation that you've got to grow, you've got to grow, you've got to grow bigger and bigger and bigger, um, which sounds a little bit like cancer, doesn't it? Yeah. The, the, go ahead. What's the, the main difference between uh, Polar Bank and Credit Union? Can I answer this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So a credit union and local banks, um, which actually benefit a lot from a public bank happening, are citizen deposit banks. They have services for you. You go, you open a bank account. Typically with a public bank, the only bank account is the state of Vermont. So the state of Vermont, I believe, but don't quote me on this, that there's a $9 billion annual budget for Vermont. So $9 billion every year comes in and goes out. And we put it all in a bank account. And we put it in a bank account with M&T Bank. But we could just put it in a bank account with ourselves. And banks can lend 10 times more money than they have. So that $9 billion becomes $90 billion of lending power that our own state could have. And we cut out Wall Street on both sides of that, where we deposit and where we borrow for our public systems. Absolutely. Credit unions and local banks typically, but the credit unions really try to avoid it. They are, especially like VSECU, even though they're merging with New England, which I think could be a positive thing after talking to a banker from there yesterday. Um, they are looking for new systems. We're hoping that the credit unions in Vermont and the Association of Credit Unions will stand behind the public bank initiative um, and continue what they already do, which is to try to find different things to invest in besides Wall Street. They will typically more invest in government bonds to avoid Wall Street, for example. But this is an even more generative approach that they can have. And Wall Street, or North Dakota has five times more local banks and credit unions than any other state per capita. That's how much a public bank supports because the public bank helps to capitalize credit unions and local banks to do more lending. So they partner with them and do what's called participation loans. The resistance to public banks? No, in the like, US? I thought my credit union was amazing, but I didn't know the effects of Wall Street. Is there a reason for them to take more money? Is that like the only reason why they would do that? Yeah, well, and again, credit unions are the best. You know, in terms of credit unions, local banks, and big banks, credit unions will avoid Wall Street the most out of those three. But any anybody, any bank or individual, or my parents, that invest in Wall Street, it's because it's the quickest return. You're stealing up land, you're stealing up water rights, you're Building private prisons, these are very, very lucrative things that Wall Street does. So you get a big return when you're investing in Wall Street and because you're destroying the most things as quickly as possible, effectively. Yes? And can I just make a comment that, you know, with the credit unions, particularly in the community bank, I mean, some people will, you know, say to me, oh, I can invest in, you know, some online bank out someplace else and get 2% interest. I'm like, do you know what 2% interest is compared to 0% interest? It's two dollars instead of zero dollars, and if you invest your money on a thousand dollars, and if you invest your money locally, like in a credit union, you know they give so much more to the community than any place else. And like to actually move your money outside of the state to someplace where you think you're getting this like better interest rate, 
it really, the return on investment for the community, it, it's so much better to keep your money. And in answer to you, Sage, generally credit unions make money off of lending to other people in the community. So they charge an interest rate and then they give you a teeny tiny interest rate on your savings account. They might have like a side thing within their credit union that's like an investment side where you are like buying stocks and things like that. But in general, what they're when, when they're conducting business, it's through uh, they make their money that they reinvest into you through lending money yeah. for yeah. mortgages yeah. and things like that. They're no still selling most right. of the mortgages yes, they do. And, and interestingly, the, there are many more women in uh, management and credit unions mm -hmm. than, than Wall Street. So, yeah. I'd like to pass a piece of paper around because one of the pivotal moments in the public banking work will be contacting our legislators with a very quick email or phone call and because we're going to create a bill to try to bring a public bank forward. And when even 10 or 12 or 13 constituents contact a legislator, if they were to say, please co-sponsor this public banking bill, that will make a legislator line up to do that. So every one of your voices can really move your legislator to hop onto a public banking bill. So if you would be uh, open to me contacting you at that moment when we say it's time to contact your legislator about the public banking bill, um, then please please put your email on this paper I'm gonna pass around, okay? And if you have a good relationship with your credit union, um, it'd be great to, to let uh, Shonda and, and Jacqueline know about that because they're allies that we're hoping to uh, get behind this, um, this movement. So let's, um, oh, I don't think I, my clicker is working anymore. Is there? In this city, in anywhere you In this city, in anywhere USA, uh -oh. the res. Okay, great. So let's invest in what women are told Americans cannot afford. Ah, money is not our measure. I think that's something everyone here in this in this room can agree with. Money is not our measure. Real wealth is our creativity and our relationships. We have uh, many more elements of the um, economy on our, our webpage at an economy of our own and some goals um, that I'll, I'll just talk about briefly here. Um, investing in um, peaceable, livable lives are really talking about the time of our lives. And what we would like is to challenge why the old 40-hour work week standard to support a family is now 80 to 100 hours. We need a social wealth index to uh, account for uh, the caring that family, community, and environmental uh, environments um, make the economy even viable. We need um, the best way uh, to ensure economic well-being by seeing the picture more clearly than we now can with our money only count. We need pay equity, we need a $15 minimum wage, but why stop there? We want a 30 hour work week standard for 40 hours pay. And if you think that's crazy, Iceland is experimenting with this already. And I'll just note that they have a good many women legislators and former prime minister. So there seems to be some connection between uh, women serving in the legislature and um, these kinds of moves being made. Technology has increased our efficiency and should grant all of us, not just billionaires, ample family leave time and universal vacations for rest and renewal. And um, it's all about our time. Uh, invest in sustainable energy, including our own. 
Um, this is shifting from fossil fuel to a green new future, um, publicly financed, along with health care and child care for all of us. It's like the real, uh, the most wealthy country in the world somehow cannot afford um, health care and child care for all. Um, it's, it's crazy, it's unsupportable, and it isn't sustainable long term. And then um, the third one, invest in universal basic needs. Um, Yeah, we're talking housing, education, safe local farming, good food systems, water and waste systems, roads and bridges, and capital for Main Street's small businesses. Our lack of these comes from this economy's purpose, waged as war. Every political issue today is really economic when you look at it more closely. And who gets to decide? Will it be money kings or the people? including women and all genders of all races this time. While you are busy watching life on Main Street, waging life on Main Street for our health and happiness, Wall Street is still waging economic war for global domination. And you see that happening now with what's happening in Ukraine, right? Um, this is a fool's goal with our forests burning, our seas rising, and deadly viruses mutating. Crashing economics, bro culture, women are delivering macroeconomic policies for fair trade, fair taxes, debt-free currencies, and an end to corporate personhood with a bought and paid for political system. So you can learn about all of this on AEOO's webpage um, and in Scrunomics and um, seek out uh, any, any pieces of it that speak to you that you think you might be able to make a difference in. Um, and, and don't worry about uh, doing it all because, um, whoops, that's the last slide, yeah. Um, I was about to say with the last slide that um, it, it can feel overwhelming. It can feel intimidating because it's been obfuscated just exactly to make you feel in, intimidated. So don't let that bother you. It's overwhelming when you think about it as a whole, but just remember that inspiring women's march where you just walked one step at a time with other women and um, made an incredible statement. So I think we can continue that, that um, march toward an economy waged as life and um, I think there's a, another March happening. I just heard about this. October 8th, I believe. Anybody know about that? Anybody here involved in that? Another thing to put in your calendar, right? <laughs> uh, so make it if you can, but if you can't, just know that, uh, wh what was it that Ray said? Um, we're generating magic here and we are connected, whether uh, we're out on the street or not, okay? So I did I do this on time so that I can take any questions or? Any questions or anything that you want to say in response to, to what I've shared? Yes. Um, I guess my question is, um, Concerning like this, the state banks versus a sort of Wall Street banks and stuff like that. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've never really had to um, think about it that much because I've never had any extra money to invest anywhere. I just like um, this, this goes in, it goes out. It's just boom. But um, I, I just think that there are quite a few people that make more money than they know what to do with. And when they have that extra money, what they want to do with it is send it to somebody, like Jackie would say, like say a stockbroker or something. I want you to make more money with this money that I have because I don't need it right now. Can you make more money with it? Mm -hmm. So it just seems like the biggest likelihood is that they're going to want to take it to the stock market and explode it into whatever is going to give them the most return 
and they just don't really care about why. They just want to be like, you know, like whatever, you know, blindfold themselves. I don't care how you do it. Just turn this fifty thousand dollars into five hundred thousand dollars in five years, please. You know. So, um, so I guess what I'm wondering is, I hate to use this expression. I don't want to use it. But bang for the buck. You know, it's like, it's like, um, you know, like people want to get this money back from their money. Can you do that with the state system? Like in that, that kind of, the proportions seem so crazy to me when I hear people talk about like, oh, I'm going to invest this little money and then they're going to go take that and do this stuff with it and turn it into tons more money. You know, that's what I'm wondering about. So are you asking about the public bank? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I guess I just feel like it's kind of a hard sell to, to ask people who have all this extra money floating around, can you, oh, by the way, can you just keep that in our state instead of sending it to Wall Street so you can get this huge amount of back on your investment? Because a lot of people just don't really care about the fact that our planet is about to die or, or whatever but from all the wars and all the poisons and everything like that. Well, I, I think you're right. I'm, I, and the public bank wouldn't um, affect any any investor who wanted to invest outside of the state. They should surely do that. But the tax money that they pay to the state would be part of what would go into the public bank. Okay. So you're sort of talking about the tax base rather than the personal <clears throat> yes. investment. That's right. Yes. Yes. Okay. It's our shared revenue as, as a state. Uh -huh. yeah, so, there, so, in other words, you can choose to have the tax base stay in the state, but do whatever how you want with. You can go out and invest in however you want to invest. Yeah, I see. Money. So, yeah. It's, yeah. And it's, I, I'll just mention uh, uh, some women. I know that um, capitalism has um, a, a bad um, rep. And uh, so does socialism, for that matter. But like uh, Rianne Eisler says, you know, those isms are sort of beside the point. What we're really talking about is a spectrum of um, that ranges from domination over here to partnership over here. And um, both capitalism and socialism have had its share of both of those uh, all along that spectrum, right? So... Um, there are w women who have money who are trying to make a difference. For instance, I've just learned about an organization called Invest for Better. Women lead the way. And um, they're, they're creating, actually, we stole the idea of learning circles from them. They have investment circles where women are getting together and learning about investments and where can we put our money that would give us the return that we are looking for. Um, one of that organization's founders has written a book called Activate Your Money. Uh, that's the title. I forget the subtitle right now. But um, so, so there are uh, capitalist women who understand that this version of capitalism with this extreme domination by a very small group of billionaires um, is, is not the only possibility for capitalism. And... Um, and I think ideally we'll, we'll, we'll sort of kind of mix it all up to come up. I mean, because some of the things we, we do want to do collectively and other things we want to do individually and independently. So, yes. Uh huh. Thank you for saying it's intimidating because it's intimidating as hell. <laughs> and the system is so broken that those of us who raise children, and even if you haven't raised children, you've been in the system that just keeps you getting through every single day so that you don't have the time to research about even where your money or where your company you're working for that might be giving you a tiny amount of retirement or where you yeah. put it. And I have and because I was a stay-at-home mom and you know broke after divorce and this poor broke working four part-time jobs when I met Neil, she was my undergrad faculty by the way. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I have a very small retirement, and there's been a million times that I've thought about, I have no idea what's behind that money. And it terrifies me, and I feel ashamed of that, right? Uh -huh. Because, so what small steps can 
women like us do mm -hmm. to find out because I'm like, oh my God, this could be going to the war machine. Mm -hmm. I have no clue where those funds, yeah. be it as small as they might be, are going. Right. And right. what small steps could we all take, could we take to yeah. at least educate ourselves or, or learn that much? And then can we even move them? That's that's, I know, it's a big question. It, well, it depends on where your money is and what funds you're talking about and, you know, in some detail. So, yeah, it takes some some um, conscious thought about it. And, you know, I, I know what you mean about it being intimidating. Um, it's, it's, you know, my story in uh, Screwnomics starts at the welfare office uh, where I, I was working full time. I thought I, there was something wrong with me because I couldn't seem to support my my um, my family, even though I, you know, worked on my budget, and obviously I couldn't make it. I I was so ashamed to go to the welfare office, um, but I didn't know until I came to Vermont, where women were beginning to organize and look at these things systemically. They were talking about this pay gap back then. It was like fifty nine cents on the dollar. So my ex husband had, you know a job and supported the family and I couldn't, but I didn't have an explanation for why, why am I so stupid that I can't make my budget work, you know, until I began to hang out with other women who were looking at the system uh, collectively. And I think that's what's behind the whole idea of having learning circles. Um, there are some surveys in your in the papers that we handed out where we're asking, an economy of our own is asking you, you know, what do you want to learn about? Because I think in a small circle of women where you can just, you know, be yourself and relax and talk with other women who are like-minded um, or maybe not like-minded and, and learn um, it, it, in a safe circle um, is a good way to start out. Um, and even if it's just one one girlfriend, you know, start having a glass of wine on Thursday nights to talk about <laughs> this with a girlfriend and see what what results you can get. I, I think that's what it takes. Begin to um, learn the words, uh, speak the words, uh, and, and it'll begin to come naturally, more naturally. I think I sense as a learning circle developing about divestment, because that's this question, how, do you, how would you divest from Wall Street? Uh -huh. uh -huh. My money's in this fund, and the, the gatekeeper to all money, my stockbroker or the retirement fund or whatever, they've got it. You're not supposed to call. You're not supposed to ask questions. If you ask what's in my portfolio, they say, I can give you a partial list. You can't usually even get a whole list of, of the stocks that are in a portfolio. So, yeah. um, and they'll make you feel really dumb for asking the questions. Yeah. Really dumb. <laughs> and you always have to know, they're working for me. They're working for me. Because they are really make you try to feel like it's the other way around. Um, but how do you divest from Wall Street and with your retirement fund? It's an excellent question. Yeah. They've made a very, very, very strong wall against there being easy answers to that question. And that's a big part of our work. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. not, it's yeah. not a question you should know the answer to now. Yeah. Great question. Up. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I, um, received a large portion of a retirement fund in my divorce. And right now it's just sitting in a Vanguard account. It's not invested because I refuse to, I have divested, but I'm, I'm like still sitting on this money and, um, and I can't do anything with it for like, you know, another six years. I can't touch it without big, huge penalties. Where can I invest that? Like wh where are there places to invest that, um, that are not, going to, like you say, the, the few people that I spoke to about investments made me feel sh shitty mm -hmm. and stupid mm -hmm. and like questioning them. Like, I don't want to invest in fossil fuel. I don't want to do that. And they're right. like, well, you can't not do that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's like, yes, I can. Well, yes, I can. So, but in, in the meantime, it's sitting there and I'm just like, where, where can I invest it? Where it will do some good. CDFIs yeah. Yeah. are a basic, a baseline uh -huh. alternative. Uh -huh. uh, I'm an amateur economist, and I don't specialize in investments, but 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 um, I, I do know about investforbetter.org. I think that would be a good place to look. They have learning circles, and there we might want to start one here in this area. Um, and 
and also the book that I mentioned, uh, Activate Your Money, um, because there are a lot of women who are asking similar questions who, who want, want to divest and want to put their money where it's going to do some, some good. Yes. Um, I have a quick part answer to that. <clears throat> and also just extra thoughts on it that there are, there are companies that even in Vermont that like specialize in um, helping you at, like figure that out. Um, and I also, uh, struggle with like the guilt of how careful I am with, um, well, thinking that I should need to be really careful and that I have this huge responsibility about where my money goes. And, uh, I'm reminded and remind myself that I'm actually like, I'm, not the problem so not that we you know shouldn't have any intention about where our money goes but like anyone in this room you know with the exception of like jackie maybe i don't know <laughs> just because you told us like, like, yeah. my, like probably don't have the level of wealth to like <laughs> like you know if we like divest in like if we have some of our stocks and fossil fuels that we're gonna like totally change the world. And I don't mean to take away our power. I mean to say like, I, I mean to take away the guilt. Mm -hmm. Like we still live in the society and I disagree with capitalism ever being a solution. I used to think it was okay, but like that's a whole nother conversation, but um, we still live in it. So we either choose to like go live in the woods and not interact with any of it or I'm doing that. like, great. But like, <laughs> we also have to, to some extent, meet our basic needs. And like, if you're not meeting your basic needs, then, you know, spending all of your nights staying up, like feeling guilty about having your money in oil is like, like, don't put that on yourself because the problem is like so much bigger um, and there are lots of things we can do, um, but like holding all of that guilt doesn't help anyone. No, well, I'm certainly not coming from a place of guilt. I'm oh, just sure. trying to figure out how to use this money and yeah, share yeah. resources. And I can't, I, right now it's not doing, it's not, it's not making any it's not, that money is not yeah. making any money. That wasn't a response yeah. to what you said, by the way. Perfect. Me, okay. me sharing all of that. My, my like, quick, like, yeah. people in Vermont, but that, yeah. that thought wasn't meant as a response. We, we do have to move on in the essence of time, ladies. So I just want to thank Ricky Gard Diamond. Yeah. Ooh. She's amazing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's put it in.